Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. <laughs> Cruising your way on this episode of Off 90. We visit an artist famous for her Asian brush painting and calligraphy. We talk with a local Austin man recently inducted into the Minnesota Broadcasting Hall of Fame. We learn what it means to be a free thinker. And we watch a poetry slam performed by poets who have passed on. It's all just ahead, Off 90. Hi, I'm Barbara Keith. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Off 90. All it took was one brush. Dee Teller fell in love with Chinese art because of a sumi brush. This love has taken her to China and Toronto to study and has been rewarded by numerous international distinctions. Her specialties are horses and ancient calligraphy. We visit Dee at her home near Faribault for a lesson in art and laughter that this vibrant woman is only too happy to share. I'm thinking I might add a few more very fine black lines on that. The calligraphy is fabulous, absolutely fabulous. I love it, I'm very proud of it, looks good. That's a lot better than it was a few minutes ago. Take my word for it. <laughs> Do you think I enjoy creating? Yeah, very much. <laughs> Evidently, my mother thought I was an artist um, when I started school. Because I'm sure it was probably I wanted purple trees or, you know. My name is Dee Teller. I live on Cannon Lake in Faribault. I have been an artist since the beginning, I guess. Basically, I'm an Asian brush painter because I got hooked on the brush. I was getting um, my art, uh, BS in art from Mankato State. And one of the teachers of the watercolor class was Chinese. And she said, who wants to learn to use the sumi brush, which is the Asian brush, usually bamboo, animal hair. And so that's what led me to taking, uh, to end up going to China and studying was the brush. I got hooked on the brush. The first time that I studied was at an art academy in Hangzhou, China. I met my horse master, Lot Tan. He demonstrated the horse. The class wasn't supposed to paint it, but I went back, I painted the horse. So the next, and then I was doing better than anybody else in the class. So he grabs me by the shoulder and he goes, you must come live with me. So at the time I met him, his family lived in Toronto and we would take turns. One summer, he and his family would come here for three weeks and then the next year I would go to their place and we did that for 17 years. So over the years I have won seven nationals on my horses and one on my calligraphy. In 92 I was invited by the Ministry of Culture in Beijing. It was an invitational competition. And I sent in a poem of calligraphy and I sent in a horse. And um, when I got the letter, I didn't know what it said, it was in Chinese. I had two Chinese ladies over for tea and then they read the letter and they're screaming and running around the house, you have to go, you have to go. 
So we found out on Thursday that I had won third place in the world. And that was 6,000 artists from 16 countries. So of course we had to go. But that was a huge, huge, huge honor. And um, the first thing that judges asked me, how you know to paint like Shu Bei Hong? Shu Bei, I said, I'm a granddaughter of Shu Bei Hong. That was my teacher's teacher, you know? So that's why I won. It was because of my similarity in horse style to China's most famous horse painter, who is my grandfather in art. I uh, received a grant from Southeast Minnesota Arts Council and the McKnight Foundation, and I proposed to wander in Minnesota. That's an ancient Chinese way to, to paint and to, to write poems. So what they do is get on a horse, ride through the mountain for seven days. Then they come home, write about that mountain or paint it. And so my suggestion was that I should wander in Minnesota and then use that landscape and put my horses in it. So I went to the Pipestone National Monument. And then I did um, the North Shore. And the other place was the bluffs in the east, the bluff country. The painting that maybe is the favorite out of the 12 that I did of the public is, happens to be, this waterfall that was at Pipestone. The most important thing about being an artist, believe it or not, is the process and how you feel. Once in a while, the results are magic. And part of it is you have like help from the angels, it isn't me all the time. I have a lot of help when I do this. <laughs> so I guess it's just something kind of sings to you, whispers in your ear, and then you say, yeah, this is it. Oh, I've heard of that. Now, I have to do that Cool. John O'Rourke is a veteran Austin broadcaster. He worked in both radio and television for many years as a newscaster and sports announcer. And he started the broadcasting program at Riverland Community College. O'Rourke also served as Austin's mayor for nearly a decade, and he emceed the Miss Minnesota pageant back when it was held in Austin. Now O'Rourke has another claim to fame. He has been inducted into the Minnesota Broadcasting Hall of Fame. We talked to O'Rourke about his lifetime of accomplishments. Unroll the film to the title and hold it up to the light. The early days of broadcast television, it, it, it was difficult because we didn't have any videotape. Imagine that, no videotape. So here is our next inductee, John O'Rourke. I'm John O'Rourke, and I'm a retired broadcaster. I got a letter. We feel you're qualified to be a member of the Broadcasting in Minnesota Hall of Fame. I read it, I read it again, I read it again, I said, damn, darn it, how about that? 
I loved sports. I thought it'd be nice to be a sports broadcaster. I finished Brown Institute and uh, I couldn't get a job because I was so darn eligible for the military. Got over to Korea. This was just after the fighting, but I got a job with the Armed Forces Radio Network. It was a Radio Gypsy, it's called. We had seven stations over there, and that was wonderful. It was a great place to start. I enjoyed it very much, and I uh, got out of the Army and uh, looked for a job, and I got one in La Hunta, Colorado. I found out that Austin was looking for a sports broadcaster, and oh boy, did I jump at that. Uh, I was doing news and sports on radio and television. I was news director, yes, at uh, oh, it was probably about 10 years in, I guess. I did the Jerry Lewis telethon every year, I think about 20 years worth. Thank you very kindly. Linda Heather, Mrs. Brainerd. And also about 20 years, I did the Miss Minnesota pageant. It was held here in Austin. We had two girls that made Miss America. I was asked to join a group of people that were starting to a public television station. And I also, at the same time, I was invited to start a program at Riverland Community College to train broadcasters. And it was great to see the students that graduated and have better jobs than I did. I don't know why I ran for mayor. I was 10 years, so I had five terms. Sports and broadcasting has been really the key to my existence. People say, why, why, why do you stay in Austin? I love Austin. It's still true in our society. Standing away from religion can cost you plenty. To question the existence of a supreme being risks friendships, family, even employment. A growing number of people believe they're good without gods. Is nothing sacred? Did we make it all up? Good questions for Minnesota's free thinkers. Man created God, not the other way around. Having a science background, I guess I, I, I find more fulfillment in, in you know, watching the night sky and actually wondering how that actually came to be versus just saying, oh, it's, it's really cool and God did it. Atheism is without God, not against God. And that's a big problem for a lot of people to understand. They think we're out there to destroy religion in this country. No, we want people to look at it rationally. Even within my own family, I have relatives that don't really even talk to me anymore because I'm an atheist and they're religious. And I think a lot of that is they just don't understand what atheism is. We're really no different than anyone else. Um, we, just, we just come to our conclusions based on uh, what we believe rather than what someone else says we should believe. I would definitely support the case that you can be very good without God. You do not need a God or a deity or a supernatural being of any kind in order to live a good and moral life. I think if you look to yourself and to your community uh, as the guideposts, you will live a life that is positive and meaningful and happy, but you won't define that based on either a holy book or a religious leader or any dogma of any organized religion. We tend to say that the world is a natural place and it is defined by natural laws and we as human beings who have needs for community and support and to be living a positive and meaningful life do that without the help, support, or need of gods. I've thought about that quite often, that, you know, I decided that I don't believe in the religion stuff, but in my government, 
that's supposed to be okay. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're, we're in a free country. Yeah. What do we have? Freedom of speech, freedom from want, freedom from fear, uh, freedom of religion. You know, that, that's worth celebrating. I know, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I'm really at the apex of, you know, I'm a white woman living in a free country. I can say what I want. I can do what I want. I, I can be a scientist if I want. I've got those opportunities. If I was born even 500 years ago, I'd have probably been burned at the stake for something. <laughs> probably for you opening my mouth burned. too much. Um, I'm just who I am, and I don't happen to believe in superstitions. There's lots of superstitions that I don't believe in. There's lots of gods that I don't believe in. And I, my husband teases me because I worry about Odin and Osiris and Akhenaten. And, you know, what about those guys that were so used to having all this publicity and, and people going after them? And we're not doing it now. But we just, they get replaced. And so we just replaced them again. And I replaced them with something else. Science, probably. Nature. I think if you take religion out of people's lives, you got to remember what a part of the culture that religion is. So when for some reason, any reason, you don't buy that anymore, you get separated from that social group. And I think people get lost. A lot of people are very afraid to do that because of that very factor. Hence the importance of groups like us to let them know that it's okay to be this way. And if you believe in heaven, fine, if it helps you. But don't tell me that's truth because I can't experience it. I can't know anything about it. It doesn't rationally make any sense. And the only documentation or proof people have for it is it says so in the Bible. Well, I don't take anything else on one person say so. And... I didn't take this either. And if it can't stand up against rational inquiry, it's not valid. Whenever someone like me says God, we're reinforcing the concept of God. We should all be saying, every atheist, everyone who doesn't believe in a God should always say, a God, your God, the God of, because one of the primary arguments about there not being a God is that there are so many of them. People believe morality and ethics is based on a belief in a God. Well, well that's, there's no, there's no evidence for that. There's, in fact, there's probably evidence that leans, tilts just a little bit the other way. The less, the less you get commands from a God, probably the more ethical you do become because you don't have all these constraints of who you have to treat nicely and who you can't treat nicely. And, who is equal to you and, and so forth. I think people are more subject to uh, uh, believing in things that aren't true when, when what isn't true gives them hope. Uh, I, I just want them to get kind of bring down the God part a little bit and figure out how to get hope in some other ways, that's all. Personally, based on the evidence that I've seen, I don't think there's a God. I don't believe there is one. And other people do, and that's fine. And that's how I've explained it to my children, you know, as they've gotten older and they ask about God, what is God, is there a God? My answer has always been, some people believe there's a God, some people don't, your parents don't, you can, you don't have to, it's up to you, that's the way it is. It's hard, you know, in Brainerd, there are plenty of people in my group that will not, they're not out, so to speak, as atheists. You know, we have one guy who owns his own business and he is terrified that if he makes it known that he's an atheist, he's gonna lose business because of that. Um, we have several people who haven't told their parents because they don't want their parents to disown them. They don't want to not be invited to family events. And so, it's hard because for me, I feel like I really have an easy time of it, but most I'm not representative of what most people are going through in the group. One of my brothers doesn't speak to me anymore. We had a 
a firm, loud, and animated conversation a number of years ago, and since then he hasn't talked to me. Uh, I think attitudes are loosening up, becoming more liberal towards all kinds of religions. I mean, it's not just free thinkers and atheists, but, uh, well, I guess all kinds of attitudes towards gays, towards... Uh, the, the society's just getting more inclusive. Oh, it's got a long ways to go yet for, for atheists. <laughs> I'm fortunate enough to be in a family and in a career uh, where the people I interact with are generally uh, accepting, um, tolerant people. Um, I would not say I've suffered much in the way of emotional or other types of abuse uh, for my position, even though uh, in central Minnesota there, there is a lot of religiosity. I think there's, there, it's a real easy out for a lot of people to do as they're told, to um, listen to a radio station and do what that person says to do. And I think if we look at the country, look at the world, we, we see it a lot of places where that's a bad thing. And, and I think that if people would think for themselves, base their beliefs and actions on what they believe, the conclusion that they have come to, I think it would be a much better world. I like to say that we are a group of atheists, agnostics, humanists, and all others are welcome. People can come, but they should know who we are. The Day of the Dead is a traditional holiday that originated in Mexico to honor deceased loved ones. A poetry slam is a competitive poetry performance. Organizers in Rochester combined the two to create Day of the Dead Poet Slam. We watched as competitors participated as their favorite dead poet in an environment festooned with Day of the Dead decorations and altars. The stupid jerk I'm obsessed with stands so close to me that I can feel his breath on my neck and smell the way he would smoke we slept together. I feel like it's something that brings a, an element of entertainment. Jerk I can obsess over and she talks to that dingy, bimpet blonde as if you really want to hear about her manicures and her pedicures. And her but hidden inside the crunchy shell of entertainment, there is the sticky, gooey center of literacy. Because he's a stupid jerk I'm obsessed with, and he's obsessed with doing anything he can to lend fuel to my fire. And uh, I love that. I love that kind of Trojan horsing, if you will, that in on people. And uh, the other thing we hope is that also youth and kids will see the show and think to themselves, wow, that was cool. Poetry is cool. I'm going to go pick up a book and read me some poetry. Hopefully their grammar will be better than that, but... <laughs> That's what we hope. And pass me the next painful situation, please. But he just keeps on grinning and winking. We're doing the Day of the Dead Poet Slam, and that is an event that combines elements of the traditional Dia de los Muertos uh, holiday from Mexico and other places with the world famous Poetry Slam. The twist on this is that the poets, instead of performing their own work as they would in a Poetry Slam, perform the work of their favorite dead poets and come in the character of that poet. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked. By combining these two events, we uh, do a couple of things. We invite people to remember their own uh, dearly departed loved ones uh, and also honor the memory of the poets chosen to perform tonight. And we do have uh, an altar dedicated to the, every poet uh, performing tonight. And as we did last year, we hope to do every year that this event happens. By having the performers dress up as their poet and slam with their poems, it's uh, a little bit further than the altar and they sort of embody the poet uh, for the night. So it's a fun, I think a fun way to bring the poetry and the poet back to life. Um, I guess I would say I, uh, as far as getting something out of this, Seems like a weird way to phrase it. Um, but I really feel like we're all doing this for the community here. And I've heard a lot of people say that there's not a lot of art events in Rochester 
in the past it hasn't been known for being a very artistic, especially performative community, and I think we're changing that. Well, I like to eat, sleep, drink, and be in love. I like to work, read, learn, and understand life. I've heard a lot of people tell us after last year that that was um, a really exciting event. They loved the chance to perform, loved the chance to watch performance and poetry be performed. Um, so I think it's not that there's not an interest. I, um, it's really great to be able to bring that interest uh, to completion. And yeah, the reason we decided to do it a second year is because of the performers and other audience members from last year really urging us to do it again. So that, um, it feels really good to be able to bring that here. So give them another round of applause. Take them out of That's all for this episode. Please help off 90 Meet Its Financial Obligations by becoming a member of KSMQ Public Television. Give us a call at 507-481-2095 or 1-800-658-2539 or sign up online at ksmq.org. Thanks for watching. Join us next time, Off 90. Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.